Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, a few of our uh, police officers. Uh, first is Sergeant uh, Dale. Uh, next would be Sergeant Ryan. Oh, excuse me, I got him promoted. <laughs> officer Ryan. And uh, our, last, our last officer is, uh, our canine officer is uh, Officer Kozielski. Uh They've been assigned uh, to the southern part of the district here in town who, if there are any concerns, we would be handling most of the calls down here. This is where we've been getting most of our complaints, if you want to call it, um, reference to coyotes uh, from 59th South all the way down to actually uh, 61st and Williams, where the golf course is. I'm not sure if anyone's here from Twin Lakes Parks. Uh, okay, I know you said that. Um, but our, our main concern, I guess, or most of the complaints have been coming from this Fairfield Court area here on 59th and uh, Heath all the way to uh, Western and up to 56th Street. Uh, I'm not an expert on the coyote. I've done a little research on it. So uh, what I believe has been going on is a lot of the construction that McNaughton has been doing. Uh, they're ruining their, their habitat so they have nowhere else to go, and I think they're relocating themselves to the areas where the problems are uh, happening right now, which is uh, Fairfield Court and the wetlands back there. Uh, we have a guest speaker from the Forest Preserve District of DuPage County, Dan Thompson. He's got about an hour, about an hour presentation, uh, reference the coyotes, and if you want to hold off all your questions, I'll have uh, Mr. Thompson come up and have his presentation for you. So, without further ado. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, certainly this is a issue that's uh, nothing new. Uh, however, in, in the timeline of things, it certainly is uh, a little bit uh, new when you look at it you know, ecologically. Uh, I think essentially the coyotes have been here long before the pioneers ever showed up here. However, uh, we're certainly seeing a boom in population. But at the same time, if you look at how the human sprawl is going across the landscape, you can see there's going to be no place for these animals to go except to live with us. And certainly when new construction occurs, uh, animals are uprooted and sent out. And so they're wandering around trying to find a new home. So it, it, it causes uh, issues, no question about that. Uh, I don't know how you want to do this. I can just go through the presentation, or if you feel like you'd like to ask questions as I'm going through the presentation, I have no problem with that. It will probably cause the presentation to go longer, but I think it's more interactive, and I think we get more out of it. Uh, if uh, you know, I'm saying something, and you have something that you want to, you know, say you witnessed something, you know, can you explain what I saw or what was going on? I think that certainly may help help us both, because uh, I handled an awful lot of coyote concerns. Uh, calls from the public and I really honestly believe a lot of this is just a misunderstanding or, or lack of knowledge on uh, this animal which causes a lot of concern because there's so much concern you know people are calling up I saw one in my yard what are you going to do about it it's like well what did it do well it just went through my yard you know isn't that dangerous uh, and we get this all the time and uh, you know with any any wild animal yes uh, any wild animal put poses a potential threat, but when you kind of have to start putting things in perspective a little bit. Um, we'll just kind of get into the identification. The coyotes, uh, you know, body length is only 44, 54 inches roughly. Uh, they, they stand 17, 20 inches off the ground, maybe a little bit taller here and there from, you know, toe to shoulder t tip. Uh, they have a long bushy tail. Uh, and quite often when they're trotting or running across the field, their tail's always hanging low, which is a good identification uh, mark for a coyote. And they definitely have a little trot to them when they're moving around. Uh, quite often they're mistaken for uh, German shepherds or vice versa. Uh, you know, I'm always getting these reports of, oh, we're, we've got wolves or this coyote lives 80 pounds or better. And uh, that, that just doesn't seem to be true, you know, from all the in information we've gotten. You know, in DuPage County, they're only roughly about 24 pounds, maybe a little bit more here and there. You can see the range is anywhere from 22 to 50 pounds. Um, but uh, we just don't get these monster coyotes. Now, 
uh, in New England, they do probably start getting closer to that 80 pound range. As they come from the southwest, the, you know, uh, California, Arizona coyotes are actually smaller than ours. Uh, and there's been some speculation that there's actually been cross hybridization with wolves as they've moved up to New England, which is why those coyotes are actually even bigger. But I, it also probably has something to do with uh, where these animals are located. In the desert, maybe it's much better for them to be lean and mean, you know, really skinny because of uh, harsh climates. Whereas in New England, uh, maybe they can afford to be a little bit bigger. Yes? Um, you know, I, we do have a coyote in our backyard that is about an 80 to 90 pound coyote. And I took a picture of it, and I took it to a, a, a specialist on the coyotes at the library. They were doing a presentation. And he said it was a, called a toy dog. It was bred with a dog. And it's a big coyote. And he said they're very dangerous because they're a little bit mentally well, uh, most of our research shows that koi dogs really aren't, uh, really do not uh, show up in great numbers. Now, they certainly can hybridize with domestic dogs. However, usually the cycle with uh, coyotes is not in tune with most dogs, and uh, in, in most cases they don't they don't survive well, even if they do breed and successfully breed. The young usually don't last very well and survive because they're just not uh, set up to do so. Um, so certainly it's a possibility, but uh, I, I don't know what this expert's uh, background was, how he could say that from a picture and all this. He runs a wildlife foundation, and he was talking about how the coyotes need a habitat, so he was all for the coyotes. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there, there's a lot of things that can occur out there. There's no question about that. But uh, most of the literature does seem to suggest that koi dogs really never amount to much in the population. I don't know if it's a koi dog or not, but um, I've seen a close range in my backyard. My dog's 35 pounds and it blew up our dog. Hmm. Well, you know, one of the things... a larger, too. Do we have wolves in this area at all? Not to my knowledge. Uh, Whatever to, it is, it's, it's nothing. The, Well, you'd be amazed, too, if you ever took a hose to these things and soaked them down with water. Uh, they are skin and bones. Uh, they have a very thick fur coat to help them survive the winters here, and it makes them look a lot more formidable and larger than they truly are. But, uh, you know, that's certainly, you know, something we, we hear all the time. It's going to be not as thick, certainly. And I remember seeing one close to my house in the winter, and I thought, that's a wolf. Mm -hmm. But it, it just had uh, thicker fur. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it is, it's very difficult to get an assessment on that uh, when you're out there. But all the research that's been taken so far, there's been a very extensive program up in Cook County, and uh, we certainly haven't seen any monster coyotes that, you know, a lot of people are seeing. I have a question though. Is, you're saying all this research, is there any being done here? Any trapping? Anything. Because we're, we're all thinking animals, and you're saying, oh, I don't know, it's a fur, I don't know. And then the, the paper had said, there's no one claiming there's, no one reported any incidents. So I heard almost half these people in, call the police and say there's something. I would mm -hmm. have to call. And now the police keep saying, oh, we never have to do anything. Well, th this research is going on in Cook County, but there's, you know, the coyotes up there are exactly the same that are down here. Well, size, size certainly is, you know, an issue, but, uh, you know, just because it's, you know, 60 pounds, 80 pounds versus, you know, 22 to 50 pounds, uh, you got to take that in, in result, you know, is this animal going to be a greater threat? Uh, my understanding, we we haven't had one call reported to the police. It hasn't been reported to the police where a police officer has actually gone out 
to someone's residence to take a report. Well, if I'm not mistaken, we have our deputy chief here also, and you know, if you want to speak to him and, and as soon as the meeting is over, that's, that's there's fine. There's been no reports. It's not sightings. He's talking about reports of dogs attacked. We have not had one single report of any dog or animal. It's our police department. We've seen it come, come to the door. And I, I've been, been there. I've, I've seen the dog come back all bit up in the, in the bag, in the 80-pound dog. But in defense of the coyotes, it was right. the dog that went after right. the coyotes. Mm -hmm. I, I, the coyotes. I spoke to... They have happened, but we check. We have electronic records. We checked them all, and nobody called us say that their dog was injured or their dog was killed by a coyote. And we went back uh, over a year. S some of the reports. Well, I also called four or five years yeah. ago about the coyotes, and I was told. Yeah. If you're saying it's just a sighting, them. yes, I'm talking about a dog attack, so I'm saying there's okay, no report. There I have been reports of sightings, yes. Right. So I have past history of the police saying we have to live with them, and then the dog on my block gets attacked. We didn't call. We have to live with them. That's what I was told. What are you, were you going to change your mind once the dog's attacked? Yes, you can change it once there's an attack, yes. Okay. Because um, what they say is, is, is you have to get a trap dog. Dog. trap it. I no. cannot go out and get trap a, a, a coyote, or we can't, because we're not licensed to do it. We have to hire somebody to do it. We can't go out and just kill coyotes because we don't want to live with them. But once there's an attack or something happens that we can show the danger, then we can take some action. That's different. So yes, we can do something different if a dog is attacked versus if you just cite one. Another thing. Some of the stories and reports that we've been getting haven't been as accurate as you may think as far as the one dog that was supposedly attacked by four coyotes. I spoke to the owner that, of that dog and she told me that no, it was my dog that actually went after the four coyotes. Mm -hmm. It broke through its electric invisible yes, fence. Right. That's the one. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, other than that, we didn't get a report about that dog getting attacked. We haven't gotten any reports of another dog, a little Shih Tzu that was apparently attacked uh, on Fairfield Court. Um, of course, if, if you were to call us, you know, we definitely we would come out and address the issue. Um, you know, and I'm sure Mr. Thompson here is gonna explain to you that they are protected by the state and that we can't trap these, uh, relocate them or uh, terminate them. That's, that's something that we wouldn't do. We would have to have uh, someone from the Forest Preserve District come out and, and possibly do something like that. Is there an allowable number? I've seen as many as seven. I've counted individually seven of them together. Mm -hmm. So I know that there was at least seven, and I'm really yeah, confident um, that wasn't all the ones that I've seen all at one time. Sure, and that's that's essentially probably a pack, which is. It's called a pack, but it's really a family group. You know, people think when they see a large number of coyotes that they're out to, you know, ambush something large, and that's not what they do. Um, their diet analysis shows very little. I don't even think they're capable of taking down a healthy, uh, healthy, you know, full-grown deer. Now they will prey upon fawns, which you know is helping us control a species that is, you know, extremely abundant. Um, but I, I think this all brought up a good point: is the fact that yes. Uh, you as the general public are going to be seeing a lot of things. Uh, we certainly try to be in touch with everything that's going on, but if things are not being reported, um, you know, it, it makes it very difficult for us to, you know, address certain issues. And the fact that, you know, as uh, Officer Milana said, um, a lot of things get blown out of proportion real quick with these stories, you know, how, you know, coyotes attack my dog, you know, what are you going to do about this? And you start talking with the owner, well, my dog actually was off leash. I was out in the forest preserve and he chased after the coyotes. And well, nothing really happened, but you know, the more you talk to him, uh, there's no question dogs have been attacked and killed. But until people really uh, start reporting this and we're getting accurate reporting, we can't you know, honestly discern you know, at what level is, is this occurring. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised the hell out of me. And I was just about to shoot him and decided something wasn't quite right. So I turned around yeah. and he did like coyotes always do. Five minutes later, he was over this way behind me. He circled around, checking things Checking out. that again. And I was surprised the hell out of me. He was going to go after those people. Well, I've, I've definitely heard reports of 
deer being taken down, but I haven't been able to verify that. And in many cases, I it's usually fawns, but in many cases too, when people are living close to a ma major highway where we're getting reports, I, I tend to believe it's probably a situation where a deer got hit by a car. It wasn't instantly killed, it was wounded, maybe had a broken pelvis or something, and was hobbling around, and of course the pack found it, and they're gonna do what naturally comes, you know, you know, put the animal out of its misery, and uh, that's part of the natural chain of events. But, uh, you know, We'll continue on, and I, I certainly want to encourage questions as, as things go along. Now, natural history, uh, the coyotes are common throughout Illinois, no question, uh, and throughout most of the United States. Uh, they live in a large area, sometimes 20, 30 miles in diameter. I tend to believe in the sub suburbs here. Uh, their home range is much smaller just because there are so many roads to cross. The more roads they cross, the more likely uh, time's going to catch up with them where they're going to end up getting hit by a car, and that certainly does still happen. Uh, they den, they uh, give birth to their young in dens. It, that could be anywhere from a hollow tree you know, under a log or in brush piles and uh, abandoned buildings. Quite often they'll just dig a burrow. Uh, in Illinois, packs are uncommon, they call it. Uh, essentially, in this area, uh, when you see a pack, it's, it's essentially a related family group. It's mom, dad, and the young of the year. Uh, studies seem to indicate that one or two females may stick around with mom and dad from a litter of the previous year, so they actually can help raise the pups, and they also gain some valuable maternal skills at the same time, so when they head off on their own, they're going to be better mothers. Uh, so it's not uncommon to see these large number of coyotes, especially in the fall or late summer, when the the pups are uh, much more older and mobile. They're out uh, hunting with the family. Uh, they prefer semi-open country. You know, they'll use any kind of green corridors, such as you know, going under comed lines, following riverways, railroad tracks, path, bike paths, uh, trails, whatever, to move around. Very good swimmers. Most active from dusk until you know early morning. However, they can be seen at any time of day. Uh, even on a bright sunny day, it's, it's not uncommon for them to be out and about, especially now since they have pups and they have young to feed. Uh, they're going to be very active. Uh, now, people t get upset when they see them out in the broad daylight. They think something's wrong with this animal and it's dangerous. Um, that's not necessarily the case. And, uh, you know, it's a number, another situation. I think historically some people thought they actually were more active during daytimes and they switched more to a dusk and dawn type activity because of the fact that, you know, everywhere they went, the ranchers were shooting at them uh, because of the fact that they may impact their livestock. And certainly back then, that was a matter of life and death for the farmers. Uh, but now they're, they have kind of feel they've got free reign of things. So it's not uncommon for them to see, see them out. But certainly on overcast days, uh, they'll certainly be out during the daytime sometimes. Uh, they can run pretty fast, 43 miles an hour for a short distance, but they do have a lot of stamina, so they can run for a good bit of time. Uh, you know, to their credit and survivability, you know, they're sexually mature at one to two years of age, so that certainly helps. Uh, gestation period is only 58 to 65 days. Uh, pup litter size can be anywhere from two to 12, although six is kind of average. Um, however, most indications show only 5 to 20 percent of the pups will survive, you know, their first year. It is a hard life out there for them. Uh, young are helpless, blind at birth. They stay in the den for about three weeks with their mother, and then uh, mom will start to move out and forage a little bit too, and come back and nurse them periodically, and bring food back for them. Uh, they learn to hunt when they're about eight to 12 weeks of age. You know, they'll start going out with mom and dad and learning the techniques. Uh, this is a interesting point and very important too is young will disperse as far as 120 miles. In. So uh, we've definitely been seeing with this Cook County study, uh, we've got a number of their coyotes show up in DuPage County and vice versa and they move all over the region. So uh, the coyotes are all over the place. Uh, they typically only will live for three or four years. Um, this was a study done in 2000 and uh, on Forest Preserve property 
And as you can see, the bulk of the, their diet was small mammals. It's essentially uh, white-footed mice and meadow voles are probably their biggest uh, prey sources. Uh, raccoon was 9%. Uh, 6% actually was bird. 2% uh, insect. 1% uh, was actually dog. That was kind of interesting. 1% uh, was fruit and berries. They do have a passion for fruit, though. And as you can see, the study ended in June. If you did this in the fall, when you're getting crab apples and other uh, food sources around, I'm sure the fruit, fruits and berries are going to be actually a higher percentage of their diet. Uh, yes? Yes, they do. <coughs> and Well, th this will be an interesting point. Um, I think there's definitely no question they're going to help out. Uh, we've, we have to deal with goose management in some of our preserves. And we have found in the last couple of years uh, the coyotes are actually doing it for us, which is very beneficial for us because here's another species that's, you know, native. It belongs here. However, it's uh, so abundant it's kind of a nuisance species. And we at the Forest Preserve, you know, have to monitor that situation where we have, you know, picnic areas. We can't have all these geese with all the droppings and having all these young goslings around because the parents are very protective of their young. And so that's a bad situation where you have picnic families picnicking with young kids and aggressive goose parents. Uh, so we will actually do management at those preserves. And in some of the instances, the coyotes have done it for us. And this has continued. So that's kind of an encouraging trend for us to see. Uh, just as they are helping manage the deer population to some extent. Uh, most everything we are finding is they are feeding on deer fawns or they will scavenge adults. Uh, however, you know, speculation is out. Uh, we haven't been able to document too much of them actually preying on adults. Uh, if, it is, if they do, I think it's pretty sparingly. But, uh, you know, this is another benefit of having coyotes around. Uh, rabbit was another big portion of their diet. I have a question. Yes. You said this study took place in Cook County Forest. No, this is DuPage County. This is DuPage, this is DuPage, DuPage County. County, yes. In a suburban area or a forest? Preserve? This was in our forest preserves where some of them were more rural, some of them were quite urban, surrounded by development. Um, we're actually going to probably restudy this and actually run it the whole cycle throughout the entire year to see how the diets change with the seasons. Yeah, Will Will Willbrook did sponsor that, where we did bring in the muni municipalities, trying to explain situations and try to open up communication, as you say, you know, because one entity's got all this information, but they're not sharing it. Uh, it makes it harder for us to truly assess what's going on. Uh, um, now, the study up in Cook County I was telling you about is uh, the most intensive study ever done on coyotes. Uh, and this is, they also did a, a dietary analysis of the coyotes up there. And this is essentially what they saw was voles, metal voles were 28 to 76 percent of the uh, diet. Uh, so there was definitely a range. You know, certain coyotes actually had higher abundance in one source and lower in others. But you can kind of see the range. Rabbits ranged anywhere from 9 to 28 percent. Deer again, 10 to 35 percent. House cats, either there was nothing or it was up to 7 percent. Uh, plants, 8 to 45 percent. Uh, now, with house cats, I may be a little biased. Uh, my wife actually has a cat. It's an indoor cat. I never let it outside. Uh, so I know the coyotes aren't going to be a problem for it. However, um, there's actually been studies where songbird populations actually rebounded and increased after coyotes showed up and kind of settled an area because they actually started preying on some of the feral cats out running around because even house cats, 
domesticated cats, uh, you know, is, isn't domesticated as they are, they're, they're, they're a very efficient predator. And they, they kill extremely well. And even if they've got, you know, all the food they want at ho their home and they're let the, out the range free, um, a lot of them still kill indiscriminately just because that's what they are programmed to do. And it's not the cat's fault. Uh, I, I, I honestly think most cats really should be indoors. You know, if it's a farm cat and they're actually trying to help control mice, that's that's thing. But I don't think we have a situation in the suburbs, you know, where we need cats out roaming around to kill. Yes. How could rats not kill them? I don't think we really have too many rats in the forest preserves. As you get in, if you if you get in the urban, yeah, there's no question. Mm -hmm. Well, um, these these studies, you know don't go into downtown Chicago or the heavily urbanized area. There's no question coyotes show up from time to time. How much they actually spend and live there is another question. Just like the you know, lone individual that showed up at Quiznos in the loop. Coyotes have shown up in the loop. It, it happens. I remember a couple of winters ago, one was out on the break wall uh, out in Lake Michigan, and for a week people were trying to trap it, and they could not catch the animal. And eventually he finally just got off, swam to shore, and it on. Uh, these animals are just moving around trying to find a home. They're, they get lost, they, they run into an area, they kind of get more urban and don't know where to go and get you know confused. There's nothing wrong with these individuals, they're just temporarily lost. Um, so there's no question they're there, but I don't think they really set up shop. At least I haven't been aware that you know they've called you know downtown Loop home. If they did, they certainly would have rat in their diet, no question. Uh, during this study, this is where they started observing uh, coyotes preying upon goose nests. And uh, in, in some cases, they thought you know, some of the nests may, up to 40% of them in the Chicago area, may actually uh, be preyed upon by coyotes. Uh, and I've definitely witnessed this myself, too. So, you know, this is an unfortunate situation. This is a it's a, you know, a nice bird, it belongs here, it's natural. However, uh, we as humans have created perfect habitat for them to uh, become extremely abundant. Because they like mowed turf, they like all these retention ponds, and uh, there's no shortage of that in the you know, suburban landscape. And so we provide perfect habitat for them, and then we're concerned, and we start calling them a nuisance because they take advantage of what we've provided for them. Uh, so here's a situation where we have a natural predator helping curtail some of our problems. Again, uh, 20 to 70 percent of the fawns may be taken by uh, coyotes. Uh, so that's certainly another situation where you know deer, unfortunately, are another one that's very adaptable. It's, they're a magnificent animal, but because they uh, do so well, we do have to control their populations because they will overgraze and overbrows so many plant species, we will literally lose them. And when you start to lose the plants, then of course the whole ecosystem falls apart because then all the uh, insects and birds and mammals that require those plants to live uh, no longer have that food base. Just kind of give you a yearly routine of the coyotes. Uh, mating can take place anywhere around January. Typically it's more around February, I think, here. Uh, January through March. Uh, around April, the pups will be born in the den, and anywhere from April to May. Uh, about this time, the pups are already uh, a number of weeks old, and they are in the den and probably big enough that they actually come out of the den periodically and play around near the den site. Uh, following uh, that more towards summer, you'll see the, the young out with mom and dad starting to learn how to hunt. And by September into fall, the young will disperse. However, there's two peak periods of dispersal. It's either going to be in the fall or late winter, early spring, before the new litter comes. Yes? Are coyotes the top of the food chain here? They are here. Central yes, southern? yes, they are. So what happens if they just keep mating and having offspring? And I know you said that only 20% survive past the first year, but... Well... Yeah, nothing keeps them in check because we don't have hunting in the Chicago region, uh, at least in, you know, more urbanized areas. 
Um, so outside of getting hit by cars, which does happen, uh, there is no controlling efforts here. So uh, there's other things like mange. Uh, it's a mite that gets on there and actually infects the skin to the point where they actually start shedding their fur. And in severe cases, that will kill the coyotes. Uh, we definitely see that that's pretty abundant in the population in this area. And that only stands to reason because you have an abundant resource for the mite to move around. And it's going to spread well in the population. And so in some cases, that is actually curtailing some of the population. It's certainly not going to be an overall controlling measure. Uh, is anything done uh, numbers are being taken, but you know, it's how, how often do you come across the dead animals when they die? Uh, I guess my only concern is over the past several years, they're definitely getting more aggressive. It used to be where you'd see them from afar, mm -hmm. and then if you saw them closer and you just made a noise, they'd, mm -hmm. they'd take off. Now they come right up to the windows and look in the houses. Yeah, yeah and that's, that really seems to be a reoccurring uh, problem throughout this region. Yes. I have a question. Um, do you guys plan on doing anything like uh, darting the animals, taking blood samples? Is uh, crossbreeding a problem with them within your own pack? No, because they disperse. Uh, Mom and Dad won't tolerate the young. Uh, as I said, maybe one or two females from the previous litter may stick around with Mom and Dad, but all the males will disperse, and a number of the females will. And they, Mom and Dad will literally drive them out. Okay. Uh, so they, that's you know all built in. So there's no sign that any crossbreeding or anything is going well, because in. Because I mean, I'm hearing all this stuff where you know they say that these animals don't seem right. So could there be a chance of, of darting an animal, taking a blood sample? Maybe oh, I, I think maybe mentally wrong with it. If, if there is anything wrong. With it. I I honestly don't know what people are saying. You know what's wrong with these animals? There's no question they are becoming bold, and this is essentially what I would say is this is a product of the environment they live in. Um, because of the fact that so many people like to see wildlife in the yard, they purposely feed them even though it is illegal in the state, especially to feed the deer because of the chronic wasting problem. Uh, the problem is people don't care. You know, they don't follow the law, and it's very difficult to enforce what's going on in people's backyards. And so there is an abundant food resource around humans. Coyotes know it. Most people are very fearful of them, so they give them a wide berth or run in the house, you know, the coyote starts to feel, hey, this isn't so bad, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling threatened, and uh, they start to feel very comfortable around here. Uh, to my knowledge, only one person in the Chicago area has been bitten by a coyote, and this was a gentleman who was feeding coyotes in his backyard. It became so used to him, it would literally almost eat out of his hand, and one day he decided, I want to pet it, so he reached around a tree as he was laying food out for it, and touched on his back, and that startled the animal. He turned and nipped at him because he was startled. Um, unfortunately, in most cases, it's, it's always the wildlife that ends up losing. Uh, but it's usually the humans that have caused the problem for these animals. You know, I, like out at Yellowstone, you know, someone's got to get a picture of the grizzly bear and the two cubs. I know a gentleman did get mauled by mom, and they had to put her down. Once they've attacked a human, that's just not acceptable. But it's unfortunate that she had to pay a price for someone, a human, doing something foolish. But that's all too reoccurring. And, you know, if everyone put forth their effort and, you know, tried to make them feel uncomfortable and made sure there wasn't, you know, abundant food resources for them, things like that, it, it might be a different situation. But we just cannot control the general public. And these things are going to continue on. And we definitely are seeing, there's no question, they're becoming more bold. And this is going to be an issue that we're going to have to look into. I've yes. lived on the wetland on the west side where it's open, so you've got a very good view into the wetland mm -hmm. for 10 years. And uh, the first couple of years, uh, you might have heard a howl once in a while, or a siren goes by, mm -hmm. they howl. Um, and there's probably eight or 10 in there now that howl. And it's steadily gone up every year. You sort of you know, can figure out how many are there from the amount of noise. Um, you know, how, how many can a, that you know, piece of land support? Are we going to get up to 20 or 25 in there? Or? Well, that's, that's, that's the real difficult situation is, yes, they are the top-end predators, so nothing's going to control them outside of a few diseases here and there, and that's not going to be overall effective. Uh, food resources is really going to be their limiting factor, and right now 
you know, we don't see that they're really impacting anything to the point that, you know, they, they've reached their plateau. Right. So um, yes, there are, before. there are. Yeah, I, ha I have not seen that. I, I, I always hear that, and I, I always preach that, you know, make sure you protect your garbage, but typically when garbage is being raided, it's usually raccoons. Yeah. I have not seen too much indication that uh, coyotes take advantage of those food sources. Do you see fox, too? Are they dangerous in any Typically not. But again, any wild animal could be, and if they have a den nearby and they have young kits and they're protective of them, then certainly that's a possibility. And no, they're much smaller. And that's actually one thing I don't see too much of anymore is the fox and the forest preserves because the coyotes actually have seem to have taken over the big, more open habitat and kind of pushed the fox into the more suburban backyard dwelling is where we see most of them. Did you? Yeah, it's... it's uh -huh. I've definitely heard a lot of reports of people that have them in the neighborhood, and they're very tame. Not not at all shy of people, but typically fox, there's very little to be concerned about again, but, but with a wild animal, you never want to get real close to anything. You always want to give them some distance. I was very surprised um, this winter. Uh, on a snowy morning, I looked out. 30 feet behind my house, there's like a little prairie as it before it goes into the real wetland. And uh, the foxes, or the uh, coyotes, were sleeping. Covered with snow, and I saw him mm -hmm. get up and stretch, and then shake the snow off yeah. his hair mm -hmm. and whatever. And I, I would have thought they would have wanted some cover or something. They were just in well, they, they they've they've got a very thick fur coat, so essentially all they're going to look for is a shelter, you know, maybe a low spot where they're kind of out of the wind, or at least there's a windbreak nearby. You know, and as you can see, there was snow on their fur because it's so well insulated; it doesn't even melt on the outside because it's got all the warm air trapped up against the skin, and then. Uh, that's definitely a good sign of very good insulation. They're not losing heat where it's melting the snow from their body. So, uh, you know, contrary to what most people think, typically they don't even use their dens outside of raising their pups. Once, once that's over, they're always out sleeping in the <coughs> outdoors somewhere in the open. It's difficult uh, around our houses in the summertime to sleep with your windows open. Invariably, midnight, 2 o'clock in the morning, you hear just hear all hell break loose. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that that certainly would be a commotion, no question about that. Uh, you know, let's get into communications a little bit. They are very communicative. Uh, they do have a lot of different calls, and it sounds like you're all quite familiar with their typical howls. It's not like the long, drawn-out wolf. You know, it'll start out with a howl, but then it'll have a lot of barking or nipping in it. Um, as, as you our, sounds like you're aware too, there's a lot of things that'll set it out. Higher pitched sounds such as sirens or train horns and other things go by and within you know seconds you'll start hearing coyotes howling away. Uh, they definitely uh, use that as a, you know, sometimes they just respond to that, the, the sirens and such, but otherwise, you know, because they do have a long habitat and territory to cover, they will communicate with each other. Uh, through verbal communication such as that. As you can see, this is just kind of a chart showing what typical pups, pup survival is. Uh, starting with April when they're born, it just steadily decreases all the way to March. And of course, you know, when they're starting to disperse in the fall and early, early spring, late winter, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult for these animals because in, in so many cases, the, these ar areas are already occupied. And so they have to travel long distance before they can find a place to uh, call home. Uh, as, as you, s you know, we, we're talking about, they are the top end predators, so nothing's really preying upon them naturally. Uh, so the biggest cause of mortality here in the uh, area is roadkill. Miscellaneous will count as mange and other issues, and then because the fact they are so wide ranging, a lot of them will disperse out of the areas where hunting is not allowed and they will be into more rural areas where hunting is allowed and they, a number of these collared animals have been shot. 
Uh, just kind of give you a breakdown history of the coyote in the Chicago area. In the late 1940s to 50s, you know, they were essentially rather, rather rare. They, they've always been here, but they just were never terribly populous. Uh, 60s and 70s, you know, people are starting to see them a little bit more frequently. You know, I grew up in DuPage County my whole life. I remember always seeing red fox and gray fox, but rarely ever did I ever see coyotes. Now it's almost completely the opposite for me. Uh, you know, in the 1980s, coyotes became spread region-wide in this area. And uh, essentially by 1983, all areas have coyote populations. However, that's just the 80s, and we've definitely seen that, you know, they've definitely shown up, uh, but they've, they've definitely rebounded and uh, adapted to living in the Chicago region. And they are quite abundant. This kind of shows the current distribution throughout North America. So they are essentially are everywhere. They're extremely adaptable. Uh, even though heavily hunted, you know, the coyote is still one of the few mammals who has managed to expand its range. Uh, it's considered one of the most intelligent mammals in North America. It is able to utilize nearly all types of suburban habitat, and I think you all can attest to that. Uh, here's a article on coyotes, and here's one in New York City riding the subway. Uh, they s tend to uh, prefer Quiznos in Chicago, but uh, as you can see, you know, they're going to take advantage of whatever they can. Okay, here's a bird bath in the backyard. You think it's rel relatively harmless, but you're actually providing a drinking source for the animal. That may cause him to use, utilize this in drier periods to uh, put that in his normal routine. Does that mean it's a bad thing? Not necessarily, but if you have concern about it, if you have a smaller dog or something in your yard and you don't want the coyotes here, well, then you may have to think again about, you know, what you're doing, you know. A lot of times people you know, are concerned about the coyotes and you, know, you almost want to say, well, you can always go to Chicago and live in the high rise. You won't have coyote problems, but that's not true either because here's a picture of one in an elevator, got chased by some birds into a building, ran into the elevator, and what do you know? So they, they can show up just about everywhere. This kind of goes along with what everyone's saying. You can see how the coyote calls and complaints have steadily grown. And this stops at 2001, and we're still trying to gather data from beyond that. And I'm sure we're still going to see more escalation in this curve. Uh, here's what we uh, tracked at Willowbrook, uh, all our coyote concerns and calls. And as you can see, there's definitely a, a peaks. And as I mentioned, uh, the young of the year typically disperse in the fall. And of course, look at when we're getting most of our calls. And that's where these are not too street smart or very wary animals yet. You know, they've, they've been raised with mom and dad for the summer. They've trained them, showed them how to survive. But now they're telling them to go packing. It's time to fend for yourself. So they still have a lot to learn. And now they're, they're trying desperately to find a place where there's no other coyotes for them so they can set up shops. So this is where they're going to typically be showing up in people's yards, moving through the area, uh, just wandering, trying to find food. And so it's, it's not unusual that we're going to get a lot of calls. And I also think, too, once you start to move into winter seasons, when you start getting more snow on the ground, the vegetation's matted, it's not as dense, the coyotes, it's harder for them to move around without being spotted. And so more calls definitely come in. Um, you know, coyotes are canines, and uh, you know, one of our biggest problems is uh, interactions with domesticated dogs. Uh, and there, there's a, a lot of encounters that happen, and they're not always aggressive, but we're definitely seeing there are aggressive encounters going on too. Um, you know, with any dog, even domesticated dogs, between one to another, uh, you see all kinds of interactions, and you see some that just want to meet each other, uh, check each other out have a good time, and then there's others where they just don't like each other from the start. And that's kind of a situation that can arise with coyotes and domesticated dogs. There's a lot of cases where I've heard, you know, a lot of encounters go on, nothing, nothing aggressive is happening, but I've also heard, you know, yes, my dog was killed and attacked. Uh, no, I, that's just a little reminder. Uh, at Herrick Lake, there was a situation where we had a dog walker, even though it's requ 
required by our ordinances that a dog must be leashed at all times when rather than forest preserve. Well, this gentleman think, thought he was certainly above and beyond the law. He doesn't have to do that, so he would always let his dog run off whenever he saw the coyotes. And his dog had fun with the coyotes. They'd run around, they'd have a good time. Uh, but unfortunately, this is one of those situations where the coyotes come back, follow the dog back to the owner, and they start to say, hey, you know, this guy's not so bad. I shouldn't be so scared of humans. Uh, it's just not a good, good way for this to occur because of the fact that, you know, this is kind of training the coyotes that, you know, it's okay to be, come close to humans and it's not going to be a problem. And again, I can't stress enough, you know, we have leash laws to protect our wildlife in the forest preserves and to protect your dog. You know, what if that encounter got aggressive? What's he going to do? Well, if the, his dog's not going to interact with the coyotes if it's on a leash. Because the dog's not going to be able to run out after him. Yeah, so that, that's essentially, you know, our problem. And then East Branch was another situation where I got a frantic call. The guy's saying, you know, what are you going to do about the coyotes? You know, they attacked my dog. And the more I talked to him, well, actually, my dog was not on leash. It ran after the coyotes. It interacted with them. Well, it really wasn't even aggressive. But, you know, I didn't like when the coyotes got close to me when they followed my dog back in. And this is, again, where it's just training these animals. And another one of the situations where we're hearing, okay, we got another coyote attack on a dog, and then it turned out, well, it really wasn't much. Uh, there's no question dogs have been attacked and been killed. But uh, I think people tend to over-exaggerate uh, sometimes because of the hysteria going on about this. Uh, Springbrook Prairie, this actually occurred on my parents' street uh, across from one of our forest preserves where a small group of coyotes was going right down the middle of the street. They were right across the street from a big forest preserve where the coyotes uh, love to be. And uh, the neighbors had three little shih tzus and the dominant dog of the domesticated one went after the coyote and uh, went right up to the male coyote and all the coyote did was turn, give it a little nip and say, you know, back off. Now they could have clearly killed it if they wanted to, but they, they wanted nothing to do with it and the dog instigated the interaction. Now that, those are just cases where, you know, people tend to blow things out of proportion. But, you know, we definitely are trying to document the cases now we have seen where animals have been attacked and or killed. Because uh, that definitely is increasing. But it, inc situations like this certainly don't help the, you know, wariness of the coyotes. As I mentioned before, cats really should not let out to be roaming free. Um, dogs, I, you know, you really need to supervise them. Most villages and cities in the Chicago region actually do have a leash law. Uh, the Forest Preserve does, and DuPage County I know does. Um, you know, if you're going to put them out in your yard, that's, that's one of those situations where it's probably best to supervise them. Uh, if you don't, then maybe you're going to have to put a fence, but then some subdivisions have, you know, laws stating you can't put fences in, so. Is there any evidence that turning a light on at night <coughs> I, I've heard that's a good tactic. I'm just, you know, I, I think motion sensor lights might be actually better, where it might be dark and all of a sudden, boom, the light comes on. Because if it's on all the time, I think it's one of those situations where they kind of habituate to it and they get used to it. Yeah. Can coyote jump a fence? They can jump quite well. I, I've heard you need at least six foot or more for a coyote to be coyote proof. And ideally, too, wood's probably not your best uh, material. Do you smell from a barbecue attract the yes. coyotes? Yes, yes. Yep. And that's one of the things, and we'll probably get to it later, but you know, if you do have a grill outside, it's best to clean it up that night because the grease will certainly attract them. Uh, general human per perception, um, you know, there's definitely no question that this is a misunderstood animal and there's a lot of fear and loathing. Uh, you know, quite often, typically, what we had said in the past is the worst thing they're guilty of is being seen. You know, where we get frantic calls, you know, I had a coyote in my backyard. What are you going to do about it? It's like, well, what happened? Well, it was in my backyard. Um, that's not necessarily, you know, very aggressive, but I, 
you know, there's no question, the longer they spend in and amongst human habitation, the more comfortable they're going to become. Uh, I did see on the, you know, I don't remember which newscast it was, but it was on television, it was a couple years ago. Uh, you know, a dog did get attacked in the backyard and had to get some stitches. And so they're out interviewing, and of course, you know, one guy's like, oh my God, you know, I, there was one in my backyard, you know, what if I had stepped out in the backyard, you know, what would have happened? I might not be here talking to you now. And, you know, we just, you know, as a pet owner, yes, you have responsibilities to keep supervision of your dogs, just as you do with small children. Uh, we haven't seen the situation where humans have been attacked. I'm not saying it's not impossible. It's certainly a possibility. It has happened in California, and I, you know, I'm concerned as they continue to get uh, habituated and used to living amongst us, you know, where's the next step? Uh, but during the newscast, you know, they're just feeding, you know, the general populace uh, fear of the coyotes. And, you know, they ended the newscast by saying, if you see a coyote, call 911. And I was just so outraged. I'm like, there, there's just no reason for that. And, you know, this is a very important phone number. You don't just dial 911 because you have a coyote in your yard. There's a lot of people that are going to have serious emergencies, and we don't need, you know, that people see that, and they, they tend to believe so much seeing the, you know, newspaper or on the news, and it's like, why is it that, you know, important that you should call 911? Uh, and, and so that only helps fuel people's fear of these animals. Um, Again, you know, yes? You know, I, I read a report that you're more likely to get bitten by a dog than you are by a coyote. Yes, and there's I'm no sure question. The police department can count to that, that people and other dogs fought yeah. more than the time in a coyote problem. Mm -hmm. Well, th there, there's no question. That's absolutely true, and I, I think we'll get into some of the statistics there. I don't, I don't want to sit here and, you know, act like the coyote's completely innocent. There's no question they're becoming more bold. Uh, they are starting to attack pets more than they have, but we have to kind of keep it in perspective a little bit. And, and I think, too, just, you know, how many people actually are really aware of the natural environment around them? I think as a society anymore, you know, so many people don't even, you know, leave the asphalt anymore, and the only gr green they get on is, is walking in their yard. And so, you know, society is relatively detached and lacks a really strong understanding of the natural areas around them. Uh, to get into some of this situation, uh, human coyote interactions. Uh, there has been one fatality by a coyote. It was a three-year-old girl in Glendale, California in 1981. Um, you know, that is a tragedy. Uh, that never ever should have happened. You know, my, my first question is, where were the parents when this happened? A three-year-old girl is just too young to be alone and unattended. And in today's society, unfortunately, coyotes are the least of your concern, especially with all the problems, the abductions going on. Uh, you know, you, as a parent, you have responsibility. Uh, since 1965, over 500 humans have been killed by domesticated dogs. So, you know, that's kind of put things in perspective just a little bit. But again, as you can see, you know, I have the picture here. The coyote's quite at home. Uh, just trotting right down the middle of the street, <coughs> kids are out, it, it's, it's potential danger. Uh, there have been attacks where they weren't fatal, but, you know, that's, that's you know, horrible. Four-year-old girl in South Lake Tahoe and a three-year-old boy in Simi Valley, to show a few of them. There's, there's been a couple others, but these were some of the more serious ones. Uh, you know, we never, ever want to see this happen. Um, that's really a difficult situation. I think in most cases the kids were in the backyard all by themselves or out wandering the neighborhood. That's still, you know, granted these still, these kids are too young to be out doing that by themselves, but you never want to see the, the situation where the coyotes are that bold that they feel. Well, in all cases where the girl was killed and these two kids were attacked, neighbors of these families were feeding the animals. And this is a continual problem that we treat, try to harp on, but we cannot, we cannot enforce this, is when people feed wildlife, they start to habituate and utilize, you know, lose their natural fear of humans. 
and this just is a reoccurring problem. This has been going on in California. It's going on here. We haven't had people attack. You know, what's going to happen in the future? I honestly can't say, but I'm certainly concerned about it. And this, again, distribution of coyote attacks in, in the area. Uh, and I don't know if you're aware, too, just uh, probably a month ago in the Tribune, I saw a short blurb. Uh, it sounded like a 22-month-old was out in the backyard with an 11-year-old cousin, and it did get attacked. It was in New Jersey. Uh, and luckily, his cousin, 11 years old, was big enough to kind of fend the coyote off temporarily until the dad heard the commotion, came out in the backyard, and was able to chase the coyote away. You know, coyotes are a valuable resource to help maintain the ecological balance here. But at the same time, we also have to be concerned about public safety. Uh, the sad thing is, as I had mentioned, really, most cases, you know, a natural coyote is very fearful of humans. Yes. California outlawed trapping completely, too. That's why they have all the problems out there. Did they? No management, no. Wow. Well, that, 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 that makes it very difficult. I, I understand, though, in cases where these children have been attacked, uh, law enforcement did respond, and if the animal is still present, they did put it down, uh, which has to happen at that point. Uh, but, you know, as I have said in the past, I, I, I believe these animals really are reflect upon the environment they live in. If we feed them, yes? We have people call us what they want us to do sometimes is put the coyotes down before anything happens so the child doesn't get hurt. But we don't know if that child's going to get attacked. We don't know what the coyote's going to do. We can't sit there and put all the coyotes down mm -hmm. because they might get attacked. And that's our problem. And when something does happen, people blame us and say you didn't react. Mm -hmm. But we can't take action until something is like I can't arrest people until they do something. Same thing, I can't go out and put down all the coyotes until we actually have a problem. And, and that's why I've had a call from some people they don't understand what I'm telling them. So that's why I'm talking to everybody here is I know a lot of people actually want us to take care of these pet coyotes and get rid of them. Uh, but we're mandated by state law too, certain things we can and cannot do. So we just can't come out and kill all the coyotes because people don't want them in their backyard. That's where we have a problem. Yeah, and that's a very good point. I think I'll probably bring that up in the down the through the presentation here. But you know, we get that all the time. What are you going to do about it? You know, well, these guys can be aggressive, can't they? They can attack me. They can attack my kids. Yeah, I suppose it's possible. It's a wild animal. Anything's possible. But we can't just arbitrarily start removing animals. Uh, trapping is not an issue anymore in relocating. You, that just can't even be done. Because if you have to trap it because it's a nuisance animal, it has to be destroyed. Nuisance animals cannot be relocated. And as it is anymore, nobody will, even further west, coyotes used to be released out in DeKalb County and more rural areas. Those counties don't want these animals anymore. And that's understandable. If they've already been habituated, they're less fearful of humans. You know, trapping is not the issue. You know, trying to create, uh, address the problem why these are becoming less fearful is the biggest thing. Uh, here's a case in, uh, you know, last year in Carroll Stream where Coyote Den was right behind the neighborhood. Parents were talking to the press left and right. Oh, I'm so concerned about my kids. You know, the coyotes are going to get them and this and that. And then the reporter takes this picture. All these kids, on, you know, where are their parents? You know, if you're so concerned about it, why are you letting them stand, you know, a couple feet from a coyote den? And, you know, my biggest concern is I didn't think there was going to, any of these kids were going to be hurt. And none of them were. The problem is these young pups were, you know, daily seeing these humans. And, you know, how fearful are these pups going to be of humans uh, with all this exposure and activity? Uh, and, you know, there's just, you know, a situation where parents are all concerned. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Well, what are you going to do about it is what I want to ask you. Why are your kids out here? Where are you? You know, why are you letting them stand so close to a, a coyote den? Um, th this is the study area in Cook County where they've uh, been collaring animals for a long, long time, probably 15 years. Um, this is the interesting thing that they saw. There's essentially three types of movement patterns in space usage. Uh, territorial, where a pair will set up shop. This is their territory. They'll find a den site, raise pups, and this is where they're going to live. Then there's non-territorial where there's transient coyotes that do not pair up. They're just trying to wait to find a void. And that brings up a good point about removing animals. Well, you can have a bold animal, 
He might not be terribly shy of you, but he's never hurt, harmed anyone, and he may, maybe never will. But you may be so uncomfortable with that, you want that animal removed. Well, you removed that animal. You've created a void now. You may get an animal in that's much worse than the one you had. And so that's why I keep saying, you know, you really don't want to be just randomly removing animals because you can make a bad situation worse. Uh, and then, of course, there's dispersal when the young are forced to move out. Uh, as you can see, these are all the locations. You know, they trapped all the animals within those forest preserves, but you can see how they're using the Chicago region. They are getting all over the place. They're utilizing everything. Uh, as you can see, the pack actually has a smaller home range because they take the prime spots and they set up shop. The solitary ones have to constantly be moving in and out of other animals' territory, so they're always on the move. <coughs> And so here's the situation showing where the territory of some of these pack animals are. And then these yellow areas show where these transient coyotes are. So they are covering the landscape. And those transient ones are just waiting for a, a void to open up, and they're going to utilize it as soon as it does. So that's a situation where, you, you know, you remove an animal, there's going to be another one filling its place right away. Uh, and you get into a situation if you just want to trap, 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 uh, it's, it's a continual battle. You can kind of see open space, residential and commercial. Well, 62% of it, open space was used. A lot of the forest preserves are undeveloped territory. They really like that. But uh, look what's available. Most, most of what's available is residential, so they have no choice but to utilize that. And commercial, again, they'll utilize that too. Here's one where this is an Ikea up in Schaumburg. This one animal spent his whole time just around the detention basins and the small green patches around this Ikea. And you can see that's all he was using. There's very little habitat there, but he was making a, a living there. And again, here shows the seasonal dispersal patterns of the pups. And you can see some of these, one of their animals even made it into Wisconsin, but a number of them traveled long distance. You know, again, uh, these animals are protected by law, so if there is a situation, then uh, a licensed trapper would have to come in to remove these animals. Uh, and again, feeding wildlife, it's against the law with uh, IDNR statutes. And again, leash laws certainly is going to help. Uh, keeping your dog and avoiding conflicts uh, will help. Uh, if you keep your dog close to you, that'll usually keep the coyotes more at bay. But I've definitely heard cases where people with their dogs on leash maybe were coming close to a den site or something else and they were being shadowed the whole time by the coyotes. There was nothing aggressive. They were just kind of monitoring as they moved through the coyotes' territory. And they certainly have a right to protect their young too. And, you know, that's one of those situations where people may not even know they're getting close to a den site. As the study showed, you know, nearly all open space is utilized by coyotes, uh, but they will utilize what other habitats are available, like the residential and commercial, and with their large-scale movement patterns, you know, they're, they're, they're covering all over the place. Now, the press always wants to harp on these aggressive encounters, but, you know, how many people have been bitten by coyotes that we know of? You know, there's peaceful coexistence occurring daily. Uh, but I don't, you know, want to sit here and you know, defend the coyote completely. You know, this is a wild animal. We have definitely seen some changes. Removal is temporary. You remove an animal out of that area, well, you can see all the other animals moving around. They're going to fill that void. Uh, trapping and removal. There was a study done in Texas where they actually looked at the coyote population, assessed it, got dynamics, and I think uh, during the study, when before they even started, I think. 54% um, of the females were breeding within the first year or first two years of their life, and their average litter size was four to five. Then they went in and started shooting the coyotes. Uh, and during that period, I think uh, it jumped up to over 90% of the females were breeding, and the litter size almost doubled. And by the time they were done with their study, the population was actually larger than when they started. So, I mean, this is one of those situations where, you know, removing animals is not always the situation or the 
the, the way to go. These animals can adapt and they can uh, actually increase their population. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, I don't know how many millions of dollars they still spend out west just to appease the ranchers by shooting the, the coyotes, but really, it's just continually in motion. You're shooting coyotes, the coyotes keep repopulating, and we're spending a lot of money. And I think we really need to be looking more for a solution. Removal only treats a symptom, is not a cure. Okay, you have an aggressive animal, you get rid of the aggressive animal, but why did it become aggressive? It's its habitat, it's living in. A new animal comes in, it's going to learn the same traits, and it's going to be the same situation. Uh, and again, nu nuisance wildlife needs to be euthanized. Uh, as I stated, you know, peaceful coexistence occurs daily. Management, again, should focus on public education first and removal last. And, you know, possible positive aspects of urban kiters is they are helping uh, maintain natural balance with some of our species, such as, you know, geese and deer, which are overabundant. Uh, you know, they are ecologically important as they are the top end predator. Now, we used to have bear, we used to have wolves, we used to have mountain lions in this region. But uh, these obviously are not as adaptable as coyotes and they cannot persist in this type of habitat. Although the wolves are making a comeback in Wisconsin and Minnesota and Michigan, but it stands yet to see that they really could uh, survive down here. Uh, I just kind of want to give a regional perspective. This is a backyard in, in Anchorage. Okay, they took a picture here. There's four black bear cubs. Uh, they said, you know, an hour before that, an hour after that, a big bull moose came through. They have grizzly bears in there that you know, kill moose in their downtown parks. Um, you know, people always want the coyotes removed because it's a potential threat. Is it a potential threat? It's a wild animal. Any wild animal could be a potential threat. But do you just randomly start going out and removing animals because they can hurt you? Uh, you know, I think that's just the exact same point you were coming across. You know, we, we have to address the issue and we have to take this, you know, on animal by animal basis. But ideally, we need to find a cure regionally. Uh, you know, boy, if we think we got problems with coyotes, you know. Kids could be out in the backyard and a grizzly could come up or a, a bull moose and rut could come up. You know, they can be extremely dangerous. And I'm not trying to, you know, downplay the coyotes. You know, those, you know, the one fatality in some of those kids that were attacked, that's just horrendous. But ideally, we have to address this and see what we can do to prevent that from happening here. Again, avoiding problems, you know, January through May, coyotes are mating. They're caring for their young, so when you're out and about, you know, once they have dens, they're going to be a little bit more defensive, and that's understandable. Um, coyotes may see, you know, if you're walking a dog, well, they see that as another potential threat. Again, though, that doesn't mean it's going to be an aggressive encounter but it's certainly a time where it would be more likely they'd be more defensive about things. Keeping a leash, you know, keeping your pet by your side is going to help keep it out of trouble. Uh, Three million people are bitten every year by domestic dogs, uh, 900 of those in DuPage County. Uh, however, fewer than 100 coyote bites have been reported over 30 years uh, in North America. So, I mean, they are a potential problem, but again, you know, look at where, where the threats are. Again, avoiding problems, our activities influence the natural fear of the coyotes. Uh, I've seen, you know, a lot of people are so fearful of these animals, they don't understand them. Uh, I have yet to see a coyote want to wander up to me or stand close to me. As soon as they see me, they always want to get away. Now, I'm not walking with a dog, and I do take dogs out occasionally to try to get those interactions because I want to see how, you know, bold these animals really truly are. Um, humans and coyotes can coexist if the natural fear is maintained, but that's, that's one of our problems is we can't get everyone on board to help, you know, do this. And, you know, I even got a call one day where these people in an office building were like, you've got to help me. We've got an aggressive goose, and he's just attacking everyone as soon as they get out of the car. And so I was like, you know, okay, I'll go check it out. And sure enough, I pull up, everyone's standing behind the counter, looking through the windows at this goose, and he is standing like he is king, right, th you know, right in front of it. And they were scared to come out. And I'm like, this is, this is crazy. And I walked up to the goose, and sure enough, he started at hissing at me, 
flaring his wings and acting real tough, but as soon as he saw I'm not scared of him, he took off. Wanted nothing to do with me. Now, I don't want to encourage people to, you know, try to get real bold and, you know, push the limit with coyotes. But I think there definitely is a, a situation where animals can sense fear, and certainly canines are very good at that. And we definitely see that oh, time and time again. And, you know, they're going to feel very comfortable when people are very timid and scared. I definitely discourage close encounters. Uh, you know, you want to try to make them feel unwelcome. Uh, you know, aggressive displays are not certainly typical coyote behavior, but uh, you know, it's important to note that you know coyotes become comfortable around humans if we let them. And this is coming from gentlemen out in California, where they've certainly been having problems for a lot longer time. You know, do not approach or touch a coyote. You know, any wild animal, you always want to give space. Do not feed coyotes intentionally or unintentionally. As I, you know, we were talking about uh, coyotes. You know, you got a grill in the backyard. You better clean it up. If you got a, a crab apple or a fruiting tree in the yard, mulberries, what have you, um, they're going to love that fruit and they're going to utilize that. They're going to find it and they're going to be coming to your yard regularly. Uh, keep garbage inside. If you have a compost bin in the yard, you know, try to keep it locked up. Again, we really haven't seen much evidence that coyotes really go after garbage. Uh, composting, I really don't know either, but certainly there's going to be attraction for them, especially if you're throwing fruit rinds out. Something you might want to consider too is that on the north side of town we had a couple of problems with coyotes and both times that I responded there it was either them or their neighbors were leaving dog food outside. Mm -hmm. So I mean not all your neighbors are here if you can pass it along. Yep. I, I've got some people put you know their dogs on a leash or whatever they put bowls of dog food outside they bring the dog mm -hmm. in the dog food stays outside and we did have a problem with a couple that we had help with the reindeer with their and uh, And that's a very good point because that's one I always talk about too is, you know, that's one of the unintentional ones. People have dogs, they leave water bowls out, they leave food bowls out. You know, they don't mean to be feeding wildlife, but the raccoons, the coyotes are certainly going to find that food source and they're going to utilize it and that's going to draw them into the yard and they're going to say, hey, I don't need to be out in those forest preserves. There's a lot of food available here and they're going to utilize it. Bird feeders too. Bird feeders are very important too because that will also draw in rodents which is going to be prey for them but they will actually go to the bird feeders too again keep your grills and barbecues inside keep them clean of food particles clean up under your bird feeders uh, keep your dogs leashed cats inside supervise them as you would a small child uh, clear brush piles or tall grass from your yard if you don't want them in there you provide cover for them they're going to feel a lot more comfortable if they can be in close proximity, but feel like they're somewhat shade, sheltered or shielded from view, uh, they'll take advantage of that. You know, what, you know, if a coyote approaches you, you know, you want to stand your ground. You don't want to run because that just causes the natural instinct to chase. And I've seen that where, you know, oh my gosh, I was out, with, you know, a coyote was following me and I just started running because I was scared and he just ran after me. You know, the coyote never did anything, but, you know, he did chase. And that's just a natural instinct of theirs. You know, you want to show your dominance. You want to make loud noises and clap your hands. Now, we used to say that, and again, I think someone even here said, you know, years ago that used to work. That They just kind of look at you and it's like, what's your problem now? Uh, there's no question there's, there's been change in behavior. Um, but, you know, you, you don't want to be submissive. You know, with any wild animal, you want to respect that animal. You want to respect the fact they're wild. You never know what they could potentially do, but that's true with domesticated dogs. You know, keep, keep a safe distance between you and the coyote and teach your children to do the same. And again, just have a lot of acknowledgments. Uh, a lot of information came from the study up in Cook County. Uh, with that, we can uh, go to any more questions if there are any. It's possible for them to, but it's extremely rare. Skunks, skunks and bats are more typically likely to carry rabies, but again, too, even like when bats get rabies, they, they don't become aggressive and go around biting people. They usually just kind of become lethargic and just lay somewhere. So there's really not been too many problems with the uh, transmission of rabies through any of the wildlife. Yes. 
Sure. Um, I'm not sure of an effective, you know, way of uh, causing the rabbits to avoid an area. You know, certainly you want to keep your, you know, yard mowed regularly so it doesn't get tall because, you know, even if you don't mow it for like a week or so, you'll start to notice rabbits utilizing that taller vegetation as cover. Uh, if they're under a tree, um, there may be something you can uh, do to change that so it's not as open or easy for them or maybe you want to open it up a little bit more so it's not as sheltered and secluded for them. Yes? They're uh, territorial. How, how far will they go to uh, defend their territory? Will they get aggressive? Well, that's, that's probably based on the time of season. You no, know, when the pups are older and they're not vulnerable, they'll just probably move out of the way. Uh, you know, if, and it depends on the situation too. Between their own species, uh, yeah, there's, there's definitely encounters. There's no question. They defend their territory. But typically uh, with coyotes, uh, you know, they will drop their scat on trails, very prominent locations to mark their territory. And that scat tells a lot about that individual animal, you know, what kind of size, health, uh, and condition he's in. So another potential rival can come up and kind of assess his opponent right away. And so in many cases, you can say, oh, this, this guy's pretty, you know, seems to be in good shape. You know, I'm not going to mess with him. I'm going to move out. And so in most cases, most encounters are avoided just by scent marking and other things. Uh, however, you know, I'm sure time to time there's going to be altercations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm the cutting the grass, so I know it's coyotes. Um, I mean, what else would wear a pass? Yeah. So I'm, I, I guess that's how they get from the wetland to the uh, the front of the house, and there's quite an open area across from Oak Street. Mm -hmm. There's a lot there that's basically a block long. Now, when they're coming through your yard, where are they heading to? Do you have any idea? No, no. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's a diagonal, so I would mm -hmm. say they're coming across the, uh, uh, they're going to go beside the house and up. Yeah, because, you know, they're going to be utilizing that wetland. They're probably another big open parcel of land. They're just actually transient coming through the neighborhoods. But that's where they're going to start to learn the habits of, hey, there's food on the way or other situations. No food in the neighborhood. We've worked hard and put out Good. Uh, and and have you had any problems? I haven't had any problems, but uh, about six houses away, they've had the problem with the okay, dog. Okay, with the dog being, being attacked. Yeah, there's the dog went after them. Okay. Well, and see, then they're, they're probably just defending themselves there. Well, we see them a lot. Of, you have your, one of the neighbors, if they have their dog out on the porch, the coyotes will come right up to the porch. Yeah, they'll, mm. come, they'll come within 10 feet. See, and that's, dog, yeah. And I can tell when something's out there because the dog will just come to the okay. door and keep looking in, and then I'll open the door, turn the lights on, and I'll mm -hmm. see them right out there. Yeah, really? And have you seen any, you know, how's your dog react to that? Because in, in many cases, I just think they're kind of sizing up the situation. Here's another canine. You know what's going on here. He's kind of in our turf. Uh, I don't know what's going on in the coyote's mind exactly, but I, it, you know there's just curiosity there. They may not have any intent to cause harm, but I can't say they don't either. Uh, they're probably just kind of checking who's in the neighborhood. But, but years ago they never did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't like, away. I don't like to see them that comfortable that they're going to come right up to the house. Hollering at it, and it just looked from behind and just just took off very mm. slowly. Didn't didn't run away quickly. Yeah. Get some bear spray. Seriously. Mm. When they come up to the deck, hit them with the bear spray. They won't be back.
Western, up as far north as like 56th Street. So they have, let's say, three block area where all those yeah. wetlands are. Um, again, like I said, I believe that with McNaughton, the builders, and even Clarendon Hills, a lot of tear downs, there's a lot of new houses going up. You know, we're ruining their, their environment. They've been here long before we have. And I think they're looking for another place uh, to live. And, you know, they, they found the wetlands behind Fairfield Court and behind uh, Oak Street. So um, I think that's what, just the other night, my sergeant was driving down 61st and Williams. He saw two of them running that way. I've seen more foxes than I actually have seen coyotes. Uh, I've seen the coyotes probably about maybe four or five times, and they were just running around. It was late at night while I was on the midnight shift. I haven't seen any during the day, uh, but I know that you know we had one of our trustees actually take photographs of the coyote on the pond uh, when it was frozen. Uh -huh. It was daytime, so they do come out during the day. Um, you know, just a few things real quick. We do have a leash law here in in, in Westmont. Uh, do we enforce it? Not, not really, we don't. Um, you know, a lot of times the dogs, they, they get out, they just, that's what happens, the dogs get out, you know, they find a hole in a fence or a door is open and the dog just takes off. Um, no, no, we, just, we enforce the people complaint. Right. If, well, if, if you get a neighbor or somebody complains, we will enforce it. Uh, but we need more complaints trying to enforce it from the people who let their dog run loose. They get mad at us trying to enforce it. But if you do, we do have a neighbor complaint, we won't give you a ticket for it. But it's not on your own property. It's off of your own property. So many people have dogs running in their own yards. And that's what I got complaints about, that they were afraid to kind of come in their yard and do it. But the leash law is once you're off your own property, the dog has to have a leash. And also, the, uh, uh, all of the uh, parks at your properties have a leash law. That if you want to walk them in the park, you have to be on a leash and not a main trail. Yes. Cat laws. Cat laws? Yeah. Uh, I believe you're only allowed a certain amount of pets uh, in your, your residence. There is a few. They didn't used to have any. There is a, a, you're limited a certain amount. And you used to have to register your cat and your dog. Uh, they stopped registering the cats a couple of years ago because people just weren't doing it. It was for a dollar. It was more, it was more hardship and cost them more money to do it because nobody's registering the cat. So basically what it says is any of your pets are supposed to be on with the cats because you have them outside. But we catch a cat and it's got no tags on it, no ID chip in it. How do we know where it goes? But yes, there is the leash law is not just for dogs, it's for your, your cats and your pets. But the problem is, a lot of times you get a dog, he's got a tag on him. We catch a lot of cats, there is no tag on them. And we end up taking them to the uh, uh, animal hospital on, in, on Hodges Avenue down our throat. So if you do ever lose your pet, you're looking for them and citing them. And we can't get a hold of you or he's got no identification and we're no chipping them. Uh, one thing reference the rabbits. I know that Home Depot has a they have a chemical. I put it on my when I put flowers and stuff. My wife puts flowers out. I spray the chemical around. It deters the rabbits from. So it's a spray. I bought it. Uh, it's not a spray. They're more like pellets. Yeah, I've, I've tried uh, it. Uh, and it, it deters the rabbits so that they don't come around the area. I mean, they they have some other. Uh, Items they use as far as for pests. There you go. Um, you might want to take a look over at Home Depot and see maybe they, they have something. Ask one of their employees or something. Uh, you know, something that will deter rabbits at least because I know I get a lot of rabbits around my house. Uh, remember, we're, we are dealing with a wild animal. Um, you know, a lot of people are, they're, you know, if they see one, they, they're amazed to see, oh, wow, you know, a coyote. Um, just be careful where your pets are if you have smaller pets uh, keep an eye on them a little bit better if you have small kids your grandkids you know stuff like that you know I live in Cook County and across the street from LaGrange Avenue uh, and we used to have the coyotes come out every night between 8 and like 1 o'clock 2 o'clock in the morning and they're howling you know I was concerned too at one time but I, I just you know I said to myself I gotta 
you know, two little kids. I just got to keep an eye on them, make sure that they're not out by themselves. I don't ever want to see, you know, one of my kids when they were babies get snatched or bitten or anything like that because it would almost be impossible to catch this thing if it run across the street into the forest preserve because the Cook County Forest Preserve is a lot bigger than some of the wetlands back here. So, uh, you know, try not to leave any food out. Like I said, you know, uh, Mr. Thompson said, you know, they, they don't go into garbage. I haven't seen them in garbage, uh, but I have seen them around uh, in the Fairfield Court area and over by uh, uh, 61st and Williams, 59th and Williams, Twin Lake Park. Uh, I've seen one, one instance up in uh, on Ogden, you know, near Richmond where Clarendon Hills is. So uh, is there any other questions for reference to police? You know, like I said, we A lot of the information that I received, I got it on the internet. Just Google, use Google and type in "living with coyotes," or and you'd be surprised how much information you can actually get off the internet. Um, Yes. Does it help to um, make sure that people report any attacks to your department? Oh, absolutely. That's another thing I was going to say. I, I, we don't want you to think that, you know, we don't care or we're pushing this off on, you know, the forest preserve or anything like that. If you do have an issue or a concern, by all means, call us. You know, we're working 12-hour shifts, so we're, we got 12 hours. We got all night to come out there all day. So don't, don't feel like, you know, the police don't want to come out there. We do. We haven't. I mean, I haven't had one call in eight years that I've been here about the coyote, but we get dog calls every day. I mean, there's not a day goes by where we I don't get a dog seven call. Years, like I, said, I have had several calls of coyote. It's always been, I saw a coyote, what are you going to do? Right. I mean, I've had a, a dozen of those. In fact, we had one where, where we actually had trapper and he's here, Randy Nader's helped us on occasion. We had a problem where one, one would leave, one would leave, would leave. We, get, we, get, we have to hire
Do you have a question, sir? No, we're seeing an attack where whites beat on the dog. Um, what I plan on doing is uh, giving this literature that I have out to the officers. I'm going to put every, one in each mailbox, and uh, if possible, we try and do roll call training. Uh, I'm going to try and talk to my sergeant, set up something to at least educate them a little bit as far as coyotes and what they should know if they get a call or if they just get flagged down by a resident as they're driving through the, the neighborhoods. Um, if the juvenile officer and we have uh, uh, officers that go to school, they're assigned to each school, but we, ha we haven't been doing that lately this year. But I'm sure that they'll, they can bring something up and you know, use one of their sessions to educate the kids as far as well, we, what they we, shouldn't do. We have to ask the school if we can't make them. Right. We have to ask them, but again, there's a good idea. That's why I'm asking. You want to educate people. It's easier to get to the kids than the parents. Good idea. We'll, we'll, we'll ask, but again, it's, if the school will let us do that in their, in their school. But if there, are, if there are any concerns, like I said, just, you know, go ahead and give us a call. Uh, you know, we'll come out and try and address it, and if, if there is a report or an incident where a coyote did bite an animal or, uh, you know, a, a, I believe an aggressive coyote is one that isn't really afraid and, and comes up very close to your, uh, we have that to you. Do you have a question? Well, I was just going to say, it seems to me it's like the Forest Reserve District ought to be educating people a little we are. better. That's in, why we, in, we came up with this. This is great, and, but, you know, what, 50 people maybe we Oh, well, exactly, you know? and that, that's the hard thing. Yeah. That's how, I don't know how you would do that, but. I've seen it in Inter get it. sessions of World War Wildlife. They give the sessions all over. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but, you know, we're people that are interested, but, you know, are our neighbors who are feeding them. Yes. No, well, that's yeah. that's why we need you yeah. guys to pass the information along. I mean, not everybody could could come out tonight. Yeah. I'm sure. Uh, so if if you can, if you know, if you have a neighbor that's that wasn't able to make it tonight, pass it along and have them, you know, maybe pass it along to another neighbor or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I had a neighbor that said, you know, let me know what they said. Okay. Is this being broadcast? Yes. So maybe an announcement on paper when it's going to be replayed. Uh, yeah, we can do that. I'm sure. I'm sure it's not an issue. I know that uh, there was an article in the Westmont Progress saying that we were going to have a, a seminar to educate the residents, um, yeah, reference coyotes. Yeah, we asked the newspaper, we can't make them do it, but we do ask them to put it in. Most of the time they do cooperate with it. And, and again, with schools, most of the time we'll ask, we need to present this or we we'll do like it. Most of the time they will let us. Depending on their schedule. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any questions? Well, I guess find this uh, slideshow or anything like that on the Forest Preserve website? We had a, some, a, little, a small blurb on it and we rotate our information periodically but uh, that's one of the things we're looking at is we do have naturalists on staff. Uh, we do have all these communicating skills and tools available for us and we're trying to utilize this to get the word out because you know that's we're preaching you know education first well you know that's our that's our responsibility. And so we are certainly trying to find all avenues we can do to uh, address this. Any other questions? No? I'd like to thank Daniel Thompson, our animal ecologist.